say, and I would like to ask Martin to take over. Have you ever said it? to Beyond Colorand, do a show of hands. Okay, so some people are not going to be there. My only regret for today is that I forgot my stickers. So I might go get them at some like during the break and then sure. go back, because I have some cool stickers. Including the Accessibility Octopus, which is from the Seattle Accessibility Camp that I've been organizing. Uh, so we're going to sort of freestyle today. I don't have a super formal presentation planned. What I'd rather do is spend some time debugging sites for accessibility together. So if you have a project you're working on that we could get to from the internet, uh, a site that you've seen that has accessibility problems, we're just going to go look at some problems on the web and I'll show you how I would debug. Um, that's pretty much all I'm planning to do today in the spirit of a bar camp or a meetup where it's less of a formal presentation. I guess before I get into that, to introduce myself, I'm Marcy Sutton. I live in Bellingham, Washington, which is up in the, all the way at the top left corner of the United States, really close to Canada, so we're almost Canadian. Uh, I work full time at DQ Systems, which is an accessibility company in the US. Uh, I think we, we have a big office in India as well. And I work on accessibility tools for developers. So what I, my approach to accessibility is very technical. So if there's any, ever anything I say that you don't quite follow, it's a great format for you to ask questions and we can talk about things that maybe you need a little more information on. One thing we're going to do today is I'll walk through some of the demos that I made for a course that I have on egghead.io. It's called Start Building Accessible Web Applications Today, and it's a bunch of little bite-sized videos uh, on how to code for accessibility. I have all those demos on my laptop, so I figured we could just walk through some of those live today, uh, where normally people pay money to go and watch those, so it's kind of a fun <laughs> thing to work through. Uh, so I guess before we dive in, does anyone have a website that they want me to pull up? Since it's going to take me a minute, because I think the internet might be a little slow, so I could have it loading in the background. Anyone want to be brave and suggest their company's website? If not, I have, I have this kind of ironically, it's a, a German fake website that we use at DQ, and it's full of accessibility problems. Oh, is that one? Okay. You have a URL. You can either type it in or, or up here, or I can just pull it up. This will make it much more candid because I've never seen the site before, so it'll be like a real debugging process. Maybe we could do a show of hands of who here is a developer, web developer. Okay, so the majority of people. So for everyone who isn't a developer, what do you work on? Are you like more design focused? Maybe just shout it out if, if you aren't a developer, what it is that you specialize in? User experience. Okay. User Which is really important because that's where accessibility starts. I'm sorry, I have User experience. User experience. Um, so sometimes as developers, we're not set up for success. If accessibility hasn't been considered from the beginning, we can only do so much as the quote cleanup crew. And I've been in that position where accessibility is not considered from the top down at a company and it's really hard to catch up. You just, you're set up to fail a lot of times. So it's great to have some user experience expertise in the room. We can do a lot with development, uh, but we can only go so far. Like if your brand colors, are, don't have enough contrast, we can't really fix that. <laughs> yeah. We can tweak it slightly, but it can be difficult. All right, cool. Well, we'll let that load. Uh, it's going through my phone, so it might take a minute. 
So I've got one site you can go and debug, and I was just going to show you my process. When someone sends me a website and they say, hey, can you help me tell, you know, determine what I need to fix for accessibility? Um, I am not a, what we call, subject matter expert. I, I kind of am, but that's a formal job title at DQ and many other companies where you are billable hours debugging websites. Um, I do that some of the time, but primarily I work on the tools that help you to debug for accessibility, including AxCore, and there's uh, AxCore is a JavaScript library. We have some browser extensions built off of that that I'll probably use in the process. Um, so if, are there any Axe users in here? Anyone who's used Axe before? Cool, a few. There's so many different tools. Uh, it's nice to find ones that work for you. Um, but we tried to make tools that only report valid errors to you so that you don't ignore it over time. Um, but what I'd like to start with on a website is just tab through it. See if I can reach everything. See if there's visible focus outlines. So I'm tabbing through this Computech website, which we've set up intentionally to have problems so that when we run our testing tools on it, we can find those problems. So the first problem I see is that there is no focus outline for a lot of these links. So as a, uh, someone who can't use a mouse, which sometimes is me by the end of the work day or the work week, if you can't see where you are on the screen, you're going to leave the website because you can't use it. Uh, the only tip I have right now where I am on the screen is the status bar at the very bottom of the browser. Um, but this is such a common problem. Let's see how, where that CSS is coming from. So I've opened the developer tools. I'm going to go inspect one of these uh, items in the developer tools. And I just did right click in the browser to inspect it in Chrome. I'm going to go zoom in a little bit on the developer tools. So if I go and drill down into something focusable, like a link or a button or a form control, I can go and look at its styles in the style panel. And we're just diving right in to see what we can fix here. So sure enough, in the CSS for this website, that on every anchor tag, there is outline none. How many, show of hands, how many of you have seen that out, out there? <laughs> Pretty <laughs> common, and it's so frustrating to see because it's a really easy thing to fix. So if we turn off outline none, still don't really see where I am. I think I'm not focused on it. So if I focus on this item, if I turn off outline none, I get the browser's default focus style, which in Chrome is this blue ring. Uh, some people really hate the blue ring. Have, 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 has anyone had to have that battle with your design team where they're like, <laughs> we hate it. I think that the word I actually heard or phrase was quote, but ugly. Uh, so having to counteract that with, okay, well, what can we do to keep everyone happy? Um, one thing you could do if you must turn off outline none uh, is we could go and set a focus style. So in here, let's see if I can add a style. Sort of difficult in here. So I could do A colon focus. If I can type it correctly. And then maybe we could add a, like change the background color maybe. That would be a pretty, uh, it would blend in with this design. So this row of navigation, there's the current item, uh, the current page is a, a red background color, and then the, the rest of the items in this nav bar are dark gray. So maybe we could just make it really obvious. So if it's focused, it's not showing us anything. So background color, I guess one, rather than add a style right in here, there is CSS for this top nav. And it's got the link style, the visited, and a hover style, which that happens all the time. They think of hover, but they don't think of focus, which is kind of frustrating. Uh, but what that illustrates to me is that the person who wrote the CSS completely missed the fact that you can use a keyboard to navigate. And that's so frustratingly common. So I could fix this just by going, the, it's inside a, a, an element that has an ID of top nav, inside of a list item. And I can say a colon focus. And then it should give me something. I guess the problem here is that they have a hover style uh, that matches the current page. So we would need something to differentiate the, the interaction style from the current page. Um, and that could be anything. I guess it's sort of difficult to debug or to add styles in the debugger. Um, I don't have the source code to the site. Right click on the A tag and uh, they look like in focus. Uh, like when you in hover, mm -hmm. and then you have the hover style. So I've got the hover style, and now I've got the 
that's forced that, focus. Yeah, that, that activates the hover. Yep. In, in the, on the checkbox. And then you can... Oh, there we go. Yeah. Okay, so their CSS is a little bit messy. <laughs> that's what's happening. So they have a hover style, but then it gets overridden later on. So that's what threw me off. So we added focus to the one that doesn't really apply. Um, there's another item that has a colon hover. So we could go and add this top nav li a colon focus. And then since we have this focus style forced, uh, which is a pretty nice debugging tool in Chrome, they give you this little force element state. And you can go and see, well, if I force it to look like it's focused, which is a little easier than tabbing into the real item, um, that allows you to debug stuff right from the developer tool. So I like that tool a lot. Um, but going back to what I was saying about the, the current item is highlighted in red. If we make our interaction style the same, it can be kind of confusing, which for a, <coughs> a cognitive uh, person with a cognitive impairment, that can get sort of hard to use. So I like to differentiate those. Maybe, maybe we could change it to like, there's a nice little color picker in Chrome. We could go and pick a blue, maybe. So now the interaction color is different than <coughs> the current page. So it's currently only set on the, <laughs> the one item that I've added this to. So you'd have to, if this were a real scenario and you had access to the source files, you'd go and add this and, um, and then be able to see your changes at work. It's very easy to document CSS. Yes. Yeah. You are messing around if you look at the data because this is the job of the design. Yes, yeah. thank you. So this is technically how you would do it, but in a real collaborative work environment, you'd want to go and talk to your design team and say, hey, we need to consider these colors. Yeah, it, it starts earlier, exactly. So we can only do so much from development. And often, I don't know, so I've worked on teams where the designers, it's hard to get an answer. And sometimes you can just make something and give them something to react to. And then they can go, oh no, let's change it to this. So it might be one strategy if you're having a hard time getting traction to make something that is you know, the best guess that you might have and then let them <coughs> tweak it. Um, with people who are really busy, it's a strategy to try and get their attention. Give them something to react to. So that's one uh, problem that we found right away mm -hmm. is that you can't see where you're on the screen. Uh, my changes are just in the developer tools, so if I refresh, that, that's going to go away. So obviously you have to make those changes in the real source files. Um, but that's usually where I start, is just tabbing through and trying to see if I can actually reach everything with the keyboard, and if I can see where I am. Yeah, question. Um, so I just want to say, um, I um, my profession is to, to give uh, accessible information, and to have the easy to read, I don't know if anybody knows it's uh, easy to read. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would like to say one thing is to have a good contrast, to, to uh, have the colors uh, um, that you can read everything perfect. So I'm here for the accessible information, I don't know anything about the development uh, yeah. technical things, and that was what, what I want, like, would like to say, that um, you look for the contrast. And yeah, so that's a good point. There's these contrast ratios that we should consider where you've got, we've got interaction styles and then just the way the page looks based on which page you're on is this red background color. And then if you hover on it or focus on it, you want the, the color contrast of that change to be enough of a, a ratio of difference that you can tell the difference. So my choice in a dark blue is probably not enough contrast. So yeah, that's a good point. Um, so what you could do in that case is actually check the color uh, values so that they have this ratio of, I think at that font size, it's probably, I guess this is a background color, not a text color, but for small font sizes, the ratio you're aiming for is uh, 4.5 to 1. So uh, we can actually go and debug that, look at this, actu the actual color ratios. So we can go and look at the ratio for this white text color and this dark gray background color, I think I am in, I don't see my little color picker. I'm in regular Chrome, I believe. There's a really awesome color experiment that I don't know where it went. 
Um, you have to enable it, so I'm going to go into the Chrome settings, go to experiments. There is a color contrast ratio line in the color picker that I have enabled. There's also accessibility inspection in Chrome, which I would highly recommend. Um, I can go and show you what that looks like. So in the Chrome developer tool, <coughs> if you have that accessibility inspection loaded, um, it will give you a whole accessibility tree right here in the developer tools. And if, you're, if the accessibility tree is a new concept to you, um, that's basically, so on the left, we're looking at the DOM, the doc document object model, which is HTML turn in objects that um, a screen reader can announce, like a button element, or it'll tell a screen reader user what that uh, HTML is. There's also a parallel structure, um, so there's the DOM, and then that actual information that gets exposed to a screen reader is in this structure called the accessibility tree. And it really helps to debug this, this structure of the accessibility tree. And Chrome has made it so you can do this right in the developer tools. So that's one of these experiments that I have enabled. It'll tell you what the role of something is, uh, what the computed text is. So there's multiple ways that you can expose text to a screen reader. And this debugging tool will kind of tell you which thing won. Like if you have multiple attributes in ARIA or something that you've added on here and you're not sure which one's winning because they kind of compete with each other, uh, this tool will allow you to go and debug that and see, okay, what's being exposed to a screen reader? But what I wanted to look at is this color experiment. Here it is. Okay, so I can go in the Chrome developer tools. There's a little color picker. Uh, and I, we should give them feedback on the accessibility of the accessibility testing tool as well. Uh, would you be able to get to it from the keyboard is a good question. Um, but what I wanted to show you is this color ratio. So we have a white color on a dark, I think I changed it on accident, from a dark gray, I think it was dark gray. So we can go and pick this color and see the ratio. So over that, the white on gray has a really good ratio. It's 12.63. And if I click on this in here, we can go and see if it's passing uh, the web content accessibility guidelines, there's two different, or a few different levels, the AA and AAA. Um, AA is this 4.5 to 1 that I was mentioning. So that's the sort of difference between the colors. And if I just drag this around, the color, we can see that ratio change and, and it'll tell you that it's low contrast. This is great because this is exposing this debugging technique to so many mainstream developers that aren't thinking about contrast. And in the past, it's been kind of difficult to do this all in one spot. You'd have to go off to some other tool and come back and like copy the color values from one place to another. And so this is just making it way easier. So I can see that it's failing this ratio. But if I drag uh, above this line in the, the kind of color picker thing, you can see the ratio change and it might pass the uh, double A level, but fail the triple A level. So depending <coughs> on how stringent you're trying to get with your ratios, um, you can pick a color that will, you know, at least meet the double A standard. So that's how I'm debugging color these days: is to go and pick a color, and then I go and make the change in the source files, and then the next time someone loads the web page, it'll have a much better color ratio. So I'm really loving that tool. Um, let's see. The next thing I would do, after I've made sure that I can reach everything with the keyboard and I can see where I am on the screen, uh, which is super important if you can't use a mouse, is I would go and run a, an extension or some accessibility auditing tool to point out common problems. And I work on the Axe tool, so I'm just going to run this on the web page. And it is saying this has no app issues, but I know it. Oh, it's saying it has no review items. So I will explain that in a minute. So the Axe Chrome extension will go and find this low-hanging fruit of accessibility things that you'd otherwise have to be pouring through the, the DOM to go and find, oh, did I misspell an ARIA attribute? Um, I've seen developers make up ARIA attributes, uh, which if you're, if you're not familiar with ARIA, that's Accessible Rich Internet Applications, and it's a set of attributes, a standard set of attributes, you can't make them up, uh, but it will expose accessibility information to assistive technologies. It's really helpful if you're creating custom components and things. 
Uh, it gets abused quite often. And when I started as a developer, I didn't know what it was for. And I had someone debug my work and they said, uh, you're really messing this page up with all this ARIA. I would recommend that you strip all of that away. You're better off just not even using it to start if you don't understand it. Uh, so I stripped it all out and I just went with basic focus management in JavaScript and off-screen text. And at the time, that was better than getting ARIA wrong. But the challenge then was that we didn't have tools like this. It took a QA person that I was working with to go evaluate it and then come back to me and say, well, you did this wrong. So with tools like Axe uh, or the Wave toolbar or Tenon, you can go and actually see these problems, um, at least for the things that you can automate. So I guess the big caveat with a tool like this is that we can't automate everything. We can automate maybe 30 to 50% of accessibility issues, um, but we want them to be accurate. So if something's automated, but it's telling you a, a, that something's a problem and it's not really a problem, you're gonna start to ignore it after a while. So some of the things that Axe found in here are all of the color contrast problems. It found uh, missing alt text on images. So this image just has a CSS class and a source attribute, which means in a screen reader, the file name is going to get read, which I think in the past, uh, depending on how you <coughs> named your image files, maybe that wouldn't be so bad, but these days, a lot of those file names are generated and they're just like a bunch of random numbers and letters that wouldn't be exploratory at all. This site has some form label problems so that uh, you wouldn't know what a form input is for in some cases. It's missing a page landmark, so it has no landmarks at all. Um, and then it has links with no text in them. So if you focused on a link in a screen reader, you'd get this file name read and you'd have no idea what this was for. So using this tool, I can go and inspect each one of these nodes. I can take some of these suggestions and it'll give you multiple options for fixing it. So for these um, images and links, uh, they're missing text. I could fix this by going into the HTML I'm gonna edit this as HTML and add an alt attribute to it. So this, where is this one? I'm gonna scroll in into view and go and see. Okay, so there's this little desktops.php is where the link goes, but it has an image in it. I think I may have just deleted the image on accident. Live debugging. Uh, and I'm not gonna refresh the page because that'll take forever to fix. So I'm gonna go to the next image that's missing an alt attribute, and this is, it's an image that goes to a, a page on laptops and notebooks. So I'm just gonna make the alt attribute, laptops and notebooks. Hit, I hit command enter to get that to take in the developer tools. So I can go back to Axe, run it again, and so the count for the links must have discernible text went from five to four. So you can kinda go in and iterate over each thing, Go do a bunch of fixes at once, run it again. Um, you could, if you have <coughs> drop down menus or modal windows, you could go and open them and then run it again. Go find all these issues. Um, so that's how I would debug, is just go find all this low hanging fruit, fix all the things you can fix, um, and then you're starting at a, a lot better baseline for accessibility issues. In Axe, we introduce something called needs review. I'll explain. We don't have any review items on this page, um, but you can go and filter based on things that are for sure violations and things that we couldn't quite tell, and those go into this <coughs> new area called <coughs> needs review, and these are things that require a little more manual attention. So they require your human intellect to go and say, is that really a problem? And there's an interface that comes up when those issues come up where you can go and decide, is it an issue or not? and then it'll save it in the extension, so next time you run it again, it'll either, it'll either be a real violation or it'll be no more, it'll go away. So that's this uh, Computech website. I'm gonna pull up the site that we had a little earlier. Is this the right web page? Uh, yeah, well, it's just the... We don't need translation. Is it missing styles or something, or is that? You know, uh, they have hide the whole portal for the outside. Oh, so okay. So it's just 
the wrapper. Got it. Okay. So yeah, we don't have authentication, so we probably can't get past it. Okay. Well, let's go run it anyway and see what happens. <laughs> so we'll go run Axe on this page, see if there's any issues. It found two color contrast issues. Yeah. Um, so we can go and inspect those. So there's a, a link inside of a nav. So it'll tell you what the ratio was. So it's saying 3.94 to 1. It'll give you the color values. Uh, it's supposed to be 4.5 to 1 for that font size, so the smaller font size. Um, so the way I would debug, um, it'll even tell you where the background, it, background color is coming from, is from this um, element with an ID of header. So I can go inspect this node. You can see it's this little tiny intern link up here, which turns out when you hover over it, will pull up a little uh, search box. So let's go fix the color first of all. We can pull up our little color picker and probably just make this a darker gray. What color is this? I think it's coming from this other one. So, where is the color coming from? So that's hover and visited. We just want the regular color to be darker. I'm not really seeing it change, so I'm not sure which one is the right, <coughs> the right one. Go. I can hit escape to get out of that little color picker. I can control click and inspect onto this element. And I'm not quite seeing a change in the styles, which is odd. So there's a color gray. That's not it. Was anyone seeing the color change? Or is it just me? Yeah, it's not not actually changing the color. So this one is a little bit hard to debug live, I guess. Secondary navigation, maybe? Nope. Live debugging is failing us in this moment. So what I would do is go and do the same workflow we had on the other side. Let's go and pick a color, change it live, and you go copy that value from over here like this. Whichever color you decide is the one that's the appropriate contrast. You can go and put that in your CSS, and then everyone would benefit from the higher contrast. Because, um, yeah, this text is pretty small. It's pretty hard to see. Um, this little search thing is, let's see if, if we force focus, we only get this box when I hover. So if I'm a keyboard user, and I want to get to, let's see, did I get did I even get to that? I can't actually, unless I'm, yeah, so I can't actually uh, get this little search thing to show up if I'm a keyboard only user. So that's an access problem. Especially, like I was saying, like the end of the work week, I can't use the mouse anymore, and then I rely on the keyboard like a lot of other people. So what we would need to do is make this little hover box show on focus as well as, as hover. So that way, no matter how you're navigating, you can still do all of the same things. So if I go and I bet. Which might turn out to be tricky because when you have a focus on the, on the link and then change the focus to the, to the box, you lose the focus on the link and the box disappears. Exactly. Yeah, it is kind of a, a cat and mouse game. So yeah. what you would have <laughs> to do is use yeah, let's see. That's why it's difficult to do things on hover. Yeah, you either have to do some really tricky JavaScript where you're focused anywhere in a container, maybe that would work. Uh, then you're relying on JavaScript to make it work. Um, usually what we do is instead of making it show when you hover, you make it on click or on keyboard <coughs> enter. So that way it persists. And that's actually easier on a mobile device. Um, if you tap once, have it stay, and then you can like hit escape or click anywhere, or, uh, hit enter or key, a key command somewhere else that isn't in this region, it'll go away. Um, so that's probably what I would do, is instead of making it happen on hover, make it so that when you click, uh, it'll actually persist. Because um, right now we can't reach this. So there's this intern link, and there's a little icon for a search and icon doesn't have any, oh, it does have some text in it. Um, but it's, it's just a, an icon in the, in the nav. It's not actually inside of a link, so you wouldn't really be interacting with it. Um, so for this, 
Okay, I wonder. I think what's happening is there's some JavaScript that's making this hover happen, and so the CSS hover in the developer tools doesn't fire the same event. So the CSS and the JavaScript are separate. Um, so that's one problem that we would need access to the source code to go in and debug, but yeah, it kind of highlights a, a gap in support for a keyboard user when you can only hover on something. So that's a very legitimate problem that you might see on other sites. Um, so we've got color interaction problems. Um, it's a pretty simple page, but we did manage to find some things that we could fix. <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of, kind of sad that we can find problems that easily, but it's re we're all here to talk about this in person. These are such common issues. They're everywhere. Um, do a see, time check. Yeah, we're probably about a <coughs> half hour, right? Well, you can take as much as the, you, there are like 40 minutes left for discussing about that. So. Oh, okay, cool. So we can just, just discuss and as as keep looking at stuff. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that is a really good point about it is this difficult situation if you're focused on a link. You wouldn't want to make the focus happen on the link to make this little search box appear. It would have to be some kind of tricky, like, sibling CSS maybe, like you're focused on this item. Yeah, it, I'm going in a loop because you would focus on the link and if you tabbed off of it, which would cause a blur event, then the thing would go away. Yeah, it, it's tricky. I would definitely recommend um, just making it persist on a click. Like a, maybe you have like a, it's almost like a, a, a drop down menu or something that would come up and then maybe you would have a little close button that you could get out of it. That would be a pattern you could use. Okay, so those are some common things. That's how I would debug them. I think for the rest of the time, I'd like to just step through some of these little egghead demos that I found on my computer. Like I can give you a tour of my laptop, which has lots of <laughs> stuff on it for accessibility. I have all kinds of demos on here. Um, since I work on testing tools, I need to go and check really gross HTML, things that I see out there in the wild. Um, just try and get them in demo form so we can fix them. So the first demo we'll look at is for buttons. And I have some icon buttons. There's two different flavors of these icon buttons. One is a real button element that's an icon button. I can tell by the markup that it's probably a little question mark icon for help. And then I have a div button, which, raise your hand if you've seen that before. The div button with a click <laughs> on it. Yeah. Oh, it makes me so sad. There's one on CNN.com's header. They have that exact thing, and it's been there for years, and it kills me every time I see it. So what I'm going to do is open this demo in the browser. We are in a buttons demo. I'm just going to go and open this in Chrome. So I've got these two buttons. With the magic of CSS, they look both like buttons, and I think this is the trap that a lot of developers fall into, is you can make it look like a button, but it's not really a button in one of these cases. So if I tab, uh, with the keyboard, I can reach the first one, I can't reach the second one because we already know it's a div with a click event on it. Um, even if I can click on it and then have it, it has an alert that came up that says do stuff, which was just a really basic binding with JavaScript to get this to open. Um, but if we debug it, we've already seen what the markup looks like. There's a button and then there's a div. I guess the, the next step after tabbing with the keyboard and then running a tool like Axe on it to find all the common problems is I would actually fire up a screen reader. So that's what we're going to do next. Um, I'm going to use VoiceOver, which I can start with Command F5. VoiceOver on Chrome. Button demo, window. Button demo, web content has keyboard focus. You are currently on web content. To enter the web area, press Control, Option, Shift, Down arrow. Button, main. You are currently on a button. To leave web content, close it, button, main. So this icon button is inside of a main landmark. It's got some sort of information. It's a button element, but it doesn't tell you that it's a help button. Uh, that's a problem. So the, the issue that we need to fix here is that the icon that's delivered as a presentational uh, icon doesn't have any actual text. And a screen reader user wouldn't know what your help button is for. So they wouldn't be able to get any help, which is kind of a problem. 
so the first thing I would add, I mean the easiest way to fix this, is just add an aria label attribute and say help. And you want to make it specific. If you have more than one button or link that does the same thing, you want to label them so that they're unique, so that that text <coughs> is actually helpful. Uh, but we only have one of these help buttons. Um, I guess a, an alternative that you could do instead of the aria label is to add a span uh, and then give it a CSS class. I am partial to the class name off screen, but some people will say like visually hidden. I think we saw one earlier that was called SR only for screen reader only. It's really just what it does in the end. It doesn't really matter what you call it. Um, I have some demo CSS in here. Let's go see if I have enough. Yeah, I have one called visually hidden. The CSS for this class, <coughs> it's a pretty common technique. It just clips it and gives it no dimensions so that you can't see it, but it still gets rendered. So we're going to go use visually hidden with no hyphen or space or anything like that. And then I'm just going to put the text in here, help. Um, so it does <coughs> the same thing as the ARIA label. It might be a little better supported. Uh, I guess the catch to that is um, iOS uh, voiceover sometimes has trouble with these nested elements. So you'll have to do some testing and make sure it works in all of the browsers and assistive technologies that your team is supporting. Um, but if we, I guess the next thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna show you what this uh, sounds like in the browser in a minute, but I'm also going to go and hide this um, icon element with aria hidden of true. So this button contains just an <coughs> icon element that has some CSS giving it display. Um, in the event that it had a glyph or some sort of an icon, like a, a letter or something, depending on how the icon is delivered, you might, that's not useful to a screen reader user. So you could say aria hidden of true just on this little icon element and then it'll be kept out um, of the screen reader announcement and instead it's going to read this visually hidden help text. So if we go and refresh and turn on voiceover. Voice over on Chrome, button down, window, button down, when the content has keyboard focus. Help button main. You are currently on about voice over off. All right, so we've delivered text to a screen reader user now. It's reachable. You can see where you are on the screen. Um, it tells you that it's a help button, so I really wish that CNN would do the same thing. So let's go fix our div button, because this happens all the time. The quickest way to fix it would be to change <coughs> the div <coughs> to a button. <laughs> but for some reason, people are just, they like their divs, I guess. So I have a div. The first thing I need to do is make it reachable from the keyboard. A div isn't an interactive element, as you may already know. So I'm going to give it a tab index of zero. Um, you can use positive integer values, like I could say 10,000, like Carl Grove said he found in a code uh, in a website once. I'm going to use a tab index of 10,000. I'm like, why? Uh, we're just going to say zero. Because what happens is anything over zero, like one, two, three, four, ten thousand, uh, they go in order. So if you have something in your footer, when you hit tab, if it's got a higher tab index value than anything else on the page, what happens is your footer is going to come first in the tab order. And that's really frustrating if you're trying to get to the first thing in the page. So you end up having to manage the tab index for the entire document, and that is a pain. So I'm just going to say tab index of zero, and that way it'll just follow the source order, the natural source and tab order. So we've made it reachable, uh, but it's still a div, so it doesn't, it's not actually a button yet. So we're going to say a roll of button. Uh, this is sort of the hacky way to fix this. Uh, making it a real button element would do both of these things for free. And the other thing that we need to do, I'm using an Angular. There's an ng click here that fires off this do stuff. The problem is that a div does not fire a key event, even if you add a tab index. So we need to say ng key down or key press, some sort of a key event. So we're going to say ng key down, and then I'm going to have it do the same do stuff function that'll fire off a little alert. Um, so you end up having to do three things instead of one thing. It's kind of a pain, but this is a, 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 a real technique you could use. Um, we also need to add text to it, like the other button. So I'm going to say <coughs> aria label and we'll call it menu. So this is all the work that you have to do to make a div button accessible. So now if I tab through the page, I can reach both buttons. Question. And the ng key down, does it also react on the tab key? Because then you have a problem. 
Yes. Okay, so we do have a problem. So it, well, it didn't, and I think that it's because of the way I've written my, uh, my JavaScript. So yeah, very good point is that if you just make this fire on any key event, it will make your event happen when they tab to it and not when they hit enter. Um, but I think my JavaScript was already written. I sort of cheated and, and moved ahead. Um, let's see, what do I have in here? There's an Angular and then a demo.js. Yeah, I don't think it is doing it on that. Um, and it may be because I've chosen key down instead of key press. That might have a limited set. Get out of this. Okay, get out of here. No, it doesn't do that. I'd have to go look into why, and it's been a while since I wrote this demo, but normally what you would have to do to prevent that is go into your JavaScript. You might have two different functions you call, and one for the key events has a little bit more logic. Um, maybe, so I have a, an event parameter that anytime you bind an event, it will give you a handle on the event object. I could go and say, if on the event object, and this is just sort of pseudocode in the moment, um, but it probably has a key code, so event.keycode or event.key, uh, it depends on what kind of event or what kind of object you have a handle on. But if I could say if event.key is equal to, again, it depends on what you have here, but maybe it's like enter, um, or you could do a key code, which I think for enter might be 32. I was going to use enter and space, um, not space. Is it 13? There's a couple that like stick in my head. So that's kind of what you would do though. If you needed to sort of filter this to only happen in some scenarios, like maybe you're binding it to the escape key or whatever the interaction is that you're trying to do, um, I would probably go and add like a little adapter function that was, I'm adding it to the scope in Angular. I could say uh, do stuff by key or something. I'm just making this up as I go. I'd have the same, event object handle, and I could go and move the keyboard specific stuff um, into its own function, and then say scope.do stuff. I'm just gonna call it, if the condition is right, if I hit the right key, this is probably not gonna work because I'm just playing around in here, but then when you bind your key down or key press, you'd say do stuff by key instead, and they'll kind of call this little adapter function so that your original functionality is sort of intact. Um, and that way you can call different functions from different contexts, um, and then they sort of like chain, and then you end up calling the real thing if the condition is right. Um, so if, you, if it was happening on tab, that's how I would handle it. Just go and filter it by the right uh, key code, or again, it depends on if you're in a JavaScript framework, what, it's, uh, what it gives you. If you're in native JavaScript, it's probably event.keycode, um, but this is an Angular 1 example. Um, so that's how I would fix uh, buttons. That's such a common thing. I wonder, let's go see if CNN still has that. I just wanna see. I think I first pointed that out like two or three years ago, and it's so sad. I've tweeted at them, I've yelled at them, I've yelled into the sky, and they aren't fixing it. We'll go and let that load in the background. One comment about keyboard users, you know, yeah, you, like you were saying, a lot of people are a keyboard user, either out of preference, because the, you can, it, it's often much more efficient if you know a hot key for something. Um, but smart TVs, there are, you know, an increasing proliferation of smart TVs, and many of them have web browsers of some shape or form, and hardly any of them have pointers on screen. So those people are, in effect, keyboard users as well, arrowing through items up, down, left, and right with their remotes. And depending on the browser implementation, they're either an on-focus event or an on-key press event. So many of those are in effect keyboard users as well. So there is a very big audience, as well as the disabled and people who have you know, RSI type issues too. Yeah, it's such a big audience. I mean, they're sort of the intersection of keyboard users and screen reader users is a big, big number. Um, and it's sad that it's so often forgotten. Um, I did get CNN.com to load, and I'm gonna go and inspect. Yeah, sure enough, still a div. <laughs> still a div, and it says div ID menu, nav menu, JS navigation hamburger, and there's, not only is it a div, it doesn't have any text in it at all, so. <laughs> 
This is so sad. It breaks my heart. So yeah, it's it's pretty hard to use CNN.com if you're uh, if you need this to be a real button, which a lot of us do. Um, so yeah, really common problems. I wish that I didn't have to spend time talking about div buttons, but this is this happens. Um, and I, the argument I've heard of why people do this is because it's easier to style, which, the, yeah, we're all making this space, so, yeah. <laughs> 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 You've got a hand up here. Yeah, not about the styling, but there's an actual uh, annoying thing in the Drupal CMS, where, uh, which is pretty popular, and uh, in their form API, which helps you create form that have <coughs> If you put there a button element uh, via the form API, it is automatically going to submit the form. So you, in sometimes it's due to backend technical stuff. Mm. Then you just, which is annoying because then you have to do a lot of the, the div stuff for you, yourself. The div roll button. Yeah. Which I went and inspected the next button over in CNN's header, and they've added a, they, it's another div button. They've added a roll of buttons. <laughs> Yeah. But they didn't do any of the rest of it. <laughs> so what we just looked at in the Egghead demo, how I added a tab index and we added a, uh, I guess their JavaScript's probably in memory and not in line here. But they didn't go all the way. They, they only added a roll of buttons. They didn't make it focusable. And there's no text in this one either. So this is so common. Like this is how ARIA gets abused is they, you think you're doing something and you don't fully understand how it works or what all the requirements are. Um, so what I would, if, if I had the ear of the, these real developers, I'd probably send them to the ARIA Authoring Practices Guide, or something that gives you uh, more context, so that you can say, oh, these are the things I need to know to use this tool, this roll of buttons. I need to make it focusable. <laughs> I need to make sure it fires from the key, uh, the keyboard, not just the mouse. Um, and so, uh, yeah, they didn't go far enough. It's pretty frustrating, but really common. So now you know how to fix a div button, how to fix color contrast, um, how to make things reachable and focusable, and yeah, we could, we're gonna be here all day to keep <laughs> talking. Yeah, any more questions or comments? Things, common things you've seen that really frustrate you. <laughs> I think the other big one for me would be headings as a screen reader user. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's probably a very, very obvious one, and maybe not even worth mentioning, but for some people, if they are really looking into accessibility, I'd want to just flag that headings, the proper hierarchy of headings within a page, incredibly useful, and good for SEO as well. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, so headings, super important to give your page some structure. Um, we talked about the document object model, so all this HTML gets tokenized, like it's parsed, tokenized, and turned into real objects that, that have value. Um, so if you're just using a div for everything, that's just a generic container. Um, and headings are another place where the, the HTML matters. Um, so I'm going to show you a tool that I use. Let's see. I'll go pull up DQ's website, pick on them for a minute. Well, I think a question regarding headings. Uh, H1 should be the, the page heading, not the site name. Page As we always say in accessibility, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on the, con the page and the context. So what I usually do as a best practice is on a home page, I would use the site title because that's the most important thing on that page is whose site are you on? If you're on an about page or an article detail, I'd say either about so-and-so, who, who is it about? Or the article title would probably be the most important thing on that page. And the page name is not a heading at all. Yeah, I've actually heard um, an argument that the if you made the H1 the site title, it ends up being redundant with the actual site title that's in the head. Um, so that information is exposed as long as you have a good uh, site title like in your in the head of the document. Um, so in that case, you could use more unique content for your headings. Um, if I can get a page to load, I was going to show you a tool. There it goes. So in Firefox, I mean, speaking about using a variety of tools, I have a tool in Firefox I like called the Web Developer Toolbar. And I don't think I have it in this version of Firefox anymore. So given that I work on tools, I have a million versions of Firefox. Let's go and find one. I think 48 maybe. 
And if, uh, if you do have to debug multiple versions of Firefox, if you rename the, uh, the actual binary file, you can't have more than one open at a time, but if you rename the file with the version, like I have Firefox-44.app, Firefox-55, like I have all these versions that I need to test, um, you can have more than one version on your machine. I've had that question come up quite a bit. So I'm gonna open Firefox 48, because I think it still has this extension. I don't wanna go and try and download an extension right now. Let's go look at, about add-ons in Firefox, see if I have this in any version. So, web developer is incompatible with Firefox 48, but we're in something older, I think. Maybe not. Version land, Firefox 48. I need to go older. So I need to find a newer tool, is what that means. They recently in Firefox, uh, as a lot of you probably know, that um, they changed over to a completely different extension model. So how you build extensions. Um, the is also available on the newer one. Oh, web developer? Oh, cool. So, okay, that's great. Um, I'm not going to check for incompatible add ons. I just don't, I haven't gotten the newest one, so I have to go back. Um, but we had to rebuild our extensions, which took a lot of effort, and there's still work that needs to be done to get the new Firefox 57 to work better with screen reader. Um, so we are hoping that will happen soon. What is the problem? It like, won't even give me, yeah, old versions of Firefox are not working so well on my machine. So I'm just gonna go and find the new one because I really wanna show you this tool. It, it, the web developer toolbar has the best, uh, the best way of viewing um, web developer toolbar. Thank best you. way of viewing headings, sorry. Go ahead, Robin. So from a screen reader user's point of view, um, whenever I hit a new page, the first thing I do is, is hit H and ideally that would jump me down to an H1 that was at the top of the body of the page so that from there I could just start arrowing down. Usually I hit a share widget straight away, which has got about 15, for me, lines of spoken stuff all about sharing with this, that and the other, but anyway. Um, <laughs> but at least I got to the top of the main arc of the page. So yeah, for me, an H1 ideally on every single new page would, also, would, already, would always be the concise summary of what this page is about, and the title in the header would be the same, dash site name. So about us dash ability now or whatever it might be. So that's the format that we find that screen readers use. Yeah, that's such a handy key when you're in a screen reader. Just hit one key and have it cycle through all the headings. Um, as Robin mentioned a few minutes ago, it's also really helpful for search engines because you're making it clear what the hierarchy of your content is. And if you've ever created an outline in Microsoft Word with all the Roman numerals and numbers and you create this nice structure, that's kind of the same idea with headings. So you're creating a hierarchy of information. Um, okay, I did get the web developer toolbar. So I'm gonna go back to vq.com. Should have just tried to install it to start with, but when you have a million versions of browsers for testing, you never know what you're gonna get. And things have been changing a lot. Um, as I said, we had to redo our, our extensions to work with the new Firefox. Um, and I know that they are making a lot of improvements uh, for screen reader support in the new version. Hopefully that lands soon. Okay, dq.com is loading. I think I On it. the upper right, is there a shift button for the web developer? For the web developer. Is there? Okay, yeah, it's probably this little icon. Cool, so things have changed a little bit. Moved around, I need to figure out where this was. Thanks for the tip. So in the, in the toolbar of Firefox, there's a little gear icon that says web developer, um, and they have a little panel that pops up. So in, in there, um, even though there's images still loading on dq.com, I think the markup's all there, so we can go and look at the heading structure. So under information, this is sort of tiny, we can go at view document outline, is what we're gonna look at. So web developer, the toolbar, will come and analyze uh, the structure of your page and give you a really helpful um, overview of if you're missing headings. It'll show you if you skipped levels. Um, yeah, we've got a question. Do you know the add-on heading maps? No. Or firewall? Heading maps. Heading maps. Ooh, I'm gonna yeah. check that one out. Mm -hmm. Heading maps. I'm 
just going to type that into my browser so I don't forget. Adding maps is also available for Chrome. For Chrome. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, it's nice to have multiple tools, multiple browsers. Um, this is not loading. Oh, it might not be working. Oh, heading maps might not be working. I think web developer toolbar was having a hard time because the page is still loading. All right, so here's a healthy heading structure on dq.com. Uh, the H1 is DQ Systems, Software Training and Consulting for Web Accessibility and Section 508 Compliance. And then all of the content sort of goes in this tree underneath. It goes H1, H2, H3, then it goes back to H2. It, what it doesn't do is jump around from H1 to H5 and, and you know, going all over the place. Um, you can use CSS to style headings, um, as you probably already know. That's what I've done in the past when I pull up a style guide from my design team and they're designing for visual presentation and not for structure. Um, you can kind of get around that by using CSS. Let's go look at a page that has not thought of headings like CNN.com. <laughs> I'm sure they use some, but they haven't thought about the overall picture of like how do these headings work together? How does the structure sound in the screen reader? So hopefully this page will we don't need all the images, we just need a little bit of markup and then I'll tell it to stop loading and try and get this extension to run again. Maybe it'll load. So we can wrap up after this. So I just heard back from my colleague Wilco that we are still hiring in the EU. If anyone is looking for a job and wants to work on <laughs> accessibility tools, uh, we need someone specifically in the EU to come and join us working on tools. Um, so that's Cool. If anyone wants more info, you can ask me while I'm here. Um, the goal of that project, uh, and the reason it's in the EU, is we're working on standardizing accessibility tools um, so that we're not all reinventing the same wheel over and over again. Um, that's a really cool way to go um, because we need more accessibility tools. Um, so it's nice to have some standards, and that's what that project is all about. Okay, so this did load enough. I'm gonna go back to Web Developer Toolbar and go to View Document Outline. They are missing an H1. Kind of sad uh, news story, sorry if that's a bummer. Um, they actually have not done too bad with their heading structure, they just kind of missed the most important thing, which is the H1. <laughs> I thought it would be worse. I think the content is worse. Um, but it's not too bad. I've seen them jump around and it, it's, they have thought of it somewhat and I think you've, even though they've missed the H1, the page title says CNN, so it's probably not that big of a deal. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a tool that I would use for headings. Um, I think we are working on getting something similar into uh, the Axe tools so that you don't have to like use a million different tools. Um, that's one of our plans for the future is to get more tools in one place so that you can do more of your job with a single tool. Yeah. So one thing I found as a front-end dev working on uh, heading structures is I work a lot with component libraries and when I make a new component, I want to do the right thing heading-wise, but I don't know where a component is gonna go. So I think what probably an H1 or probably an H2 or an H3 or something, but I don't know if it really needs to be one because it goes into the overall page structure at a point where I don't decide where it's gonna go. Yeah, that's a good point. If you're in component, like component library land, you might not know where that's going to go. And, and so maybe with, you know, the surface area of your component, maybe that's something you can configure. Like have it be an attribute that you pass into the component and then that gets rendered to an H2. <coughs> um, if it's possible to make it do an actual H1 through H6 element, I will tell you that's better supported than an ARIA uh, role of heading and a level, ARIA level just better supported and makes us all feel better about having real H headings <laughs> instead of using ARIA to try and fix them after the fact. I've worked on teams where they insist on using ARIA for everything and it's just not as well supported. It's kind of uh, difficult. Um, but that makes your component a lot much uh, more usable because they can insert it anywhere in their hierarchy and have it yeah, do the right thing. So that is a little bit more complexity that you'd have to think about if you're working in a component library. Yeah, that's, I think that's probably all I've got for today. Uh, if you have any more questions, I think we're gonna have some discussion. Yeah. I'd be totally interested in how the Axe tools could be like integrated into tool chains. Yeah. 
or is it all about like testing in the browser manually or is it what um, ways are to <coughs> there are yeah there's lots of different ways so one way is on the command line go open up a new terminal get really nerdy here so x core is the underlying javascript library and you can include that in your automated testing um, there's a WebDriver integration that it'll, it'll go inject Axe into the browser for you. So WebDriver uh, is, is like an automated tool for opening up a real browser instance, and then you can drive it to go, you know, visit this page, hit this key, and then you can write a test that says, I expect this content to be showing, or I expect this menu to be open, or whatever. Um, and so you can automate that, and the WebDriver integration will go and inject Axe for you into the browser, including iframes kind of cool. Um, but I'm going to show you a tool called XCLI, which is just a tool you can run straight from the command line. You don't need to write any tests. Um, it might be a little slow, but I'm going to say X, and then you can give it a URL or multiple URLs if you wanted to. Um, there's a bunch of different, let's go look at XCLI, on the GitHub uh, repository and on NPM, which is how we can download these things pretty easily. There's all of the configuration options. So what this will do is from the command line, power X, uh, go inject it into a browser and then run it and return you some results. And so on the XCLI repository, you can uh, see how to give it a different browser, how to uh, use specific rules or specific tags. Like you could have it run only WCAG uh, level 2A or something like that. Um, I'm just gonna run the default. I think I have multiple versions of X of CLI on my machine, so I might need to do this from a different directory. No, I have, my computer might be in a really weird state because I work on the tool, so I have like weird versions that you wouldn't be encountering the same problem. But it's not working, so I'm gonna do a, do I dare try and install this right now over <laughs> my phone? <laughs> I don't think that's gonna work very well. So I'm going to go into. Oh, there should be one by the Oh, there should. Okay. Well, I have it um, on my. I have the actual project on my machine because I work on it. So I'm just going to say. So when you install XCLI, you can just call it by X. I'm in the real project, so I can call it by its like kind of underlying source code. So I'm going to say node, um, and then I'll say index.js because that's where the code is, and then I'm going to say www.dq.com. So the first part of this is just like. The, the geeky developer way that I'm doing it from the real project. If you were using it, it would be this first command of just say X, pass it a URL, and it'll go and do its thing. We're moving it to headless Chrome, so that's the, the branch that I have checked out right now. So it's going and testing dq.com in headless Chrome, which is a browser without a display. Um, so once it has gone and run X on that web page, it's going to return um, some results to me. The results that it's returning are the same ones that we used in the Chrome extension. We're just uh, going to consume them in a different format. So this might take a minute. Um, it's sort of a big web page, and I'm doing it over my tethering over my phone, so it'll probably take a little bit longer than normal. Let's see, see if it returns in a reasonable amount of time. I think just loading the page in the browser took a while, so kind of gives us some expectations of how long it might take. In the meantime, let's see, we did get um, Axialy, uh, the repository, to come up. I'll just open that. We can go and look at the different uh, things that you can give it. So you can do kind of comma-separated URLs. You could pass it dash dash rules and the, the rules that you want. So maybe you um, just want certain rules to run in certain contexts. Um, the way this could be used is either just in your development process, just like go type it in and go and see. Um, you could have XCLI hit, say you're developing a site and you have it running on your computer on localhost or something, you could have it hit that. Um, or you could have it go out to the, the internet and hit any web page out there. Um, you could use it in your continuous integration environment. So if you have Say you have a set of tests and every time uh, someone contributes a new pull request or something and you have it run all of your, your tests, you could use XCLI in that context. Um, it's all about automating it so that you can 
get these results in the format that you need. And if you're if doing it manually in the browser is helpful, that's a good way to do it. Um, but if you need something to kind of share with your development team, that's where tools like this might be useful. Okay, that is taking way too long. Um, so what we could do instead is go pull up a demo since I have my whole laptop at our disposal. Go into my laboratory folder, my bad science laboratory. <laughs> so I'm gonna go pull up Axe WebDriverJS demo, which is a project that I have in my browser. So this demo project, it's just a, a little JavaScript folder and it's got a package.json file and in here I have a couple of scripts. There's a test script that I can run on the command line. Uh, we're gonna go into laboratory, Axe WebDriver JS demo, make this a little bigger. So if I do npm run test, go back to our package JSON, it's going to go into the spec directory to a file called remote URL test. Um, I'm actually going to, that's going to go and hit ep.com, so we'll see how long that takes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's going to go and hit this, uh, hit the same page using the Jasmine test framework. And in my test file, I'm using this AxeWebDriverJS integration, which I said will go and inject Axe into the browser, including iframes, which is nice if you have ads on your site or things that might have legitimate accessibility problems. It'll tell you about them because that's what a user would, would experience. You may or may not be able to fix those if they're in iframes, but at least you know that those are there because you are on the hook for those if they're on your site. Um, this is the wrong file. So it will go, I'm, I'm increasing the, the timeout interval because as we can see from Axe CLI, it's taken a while. Um, and I think that's purely just my slow network. But I'm gonna go npm run test on the command line. We should see it, oh, this is the browser instance in the background that Selenium WebDriver has opened. Um, so it's sort of simulating what a user would do is go visit your webpage in a real browser. Um, newer versions of Chrome have this cool banner at the top that says Chrome is being controlled by automated test software. And that's sort of to give you a little bit of a, a tip that this particular browser um, is the one that's being automated. So it's opening up a new Google Chrome. I have another instance of Google Chrome that I was using in the background. Um, it's nice to be able to differentiate. Um, this is probably gonna hit my timeout interval and be taking too long because it's just taking forever to load. Um, but what should happen, and it's probably not helping that I'm running AxeCLI in the background. So AxeCLI did return. It has uh, zero violations on dq.com, but it gives you a little tip that we can only automate so many things. Uh, roughly 20 to 50% of all accessibility issues can be automatically detected Manual testing is always required. So you do need to do more than just automation. Um, so that one did finish, that's helpful. EQ.com is loading. It might take a minute, um, but what should happen, it's going to return a similar result and say that all of the, the tests have passed. So if we go look at what we're actually testing here. Um, it's using Selenium WebDriver. It's opening Chrome. Uh, increasing a script timeout just because it takes a while sometimes to go and hit a real web page. It goes and gets the page, so dq.com in this case. Um, it's injecting a script. You may or may not need this. Um, there's this browser.execute async script. This is just making double sure that the page is really loaded. It goes and um, adds a CSS class as dq access ready. And then it, uh, when that is done and it goes and just makes sure. But sometimes you, you don't really need that. Um, after each run of test run, it will go and close the browser so you don't have all these stray, like random browsers open on your computer. And then here's the good stuff. Axe Builder, which is our handle on Axe that's injected in the browser, we can tell it to analyze the page. We're gonna pass it uh, Pax Ask Builder, the, the actual browser instance, and then in the analyze function, we have uh, a handle on these results when they get returned. So through this callback function, you get a results object, 
that results object uh, is the same thing you get in all of these different versions of apps, um, which is a big JSON object that has violations. So we can write an automated test that asserts that it has no accessibility violations. Um, we also have review items that we saw in the Chrome extension. Those are under incomplete. So if you had those and you wanted to do some sort of automation, um, this just gives you a way to automate your build so that if it has problems, like if somebody pushes a change and you had it all passing and then they break it, that would be a way that your test then would reflect that they broke it. <laughs> um, so if there's no accessibility violations or test passes, it's all green and we're all good. Um, so yeah, we did hit the, uh, the timeout interval because it took too long. Um, but we already saw in XCLI that that web page has no violations. So with a better network connection, we would get the same result the test would pass. So yeah, that's two different ways of, of basically doing the same thing. If you had issues, you'd get a big list of red problems, big, big list of violations, and it would tell you the same things that you find in the Chrome extension, just in a different format. Is there a way of like, not giving, giving Axiomai a website or a URL, but kind of a piece of HTML or stuff like that, and test, test just the fragment of the document or something? You can. So Axiomai under the hood is going to inject it into the browser, because Ax needs uh, an actual browser. Um, but two things you could do is um, <coughs> you can have it scoped to a specific element. Um, so, in this case, we could say include an element with an ID of main, and you could just do that, or you could say exclude this other part of a page. So you could sort of have it only focus on a certain part of the page using include and exclude, and that's the same in the Axe Core API. It's just the sort of surface area of the API is a little bit different. Um, I think in regular Axe. It's part of the configuration object that you pass it. But I think uh, recently we pushed a change to XCLI so you can have it run on local files. So it doesn't have to be on an actual server. Um, you can have it run on localhost or on, out on the web, but you can now pass it file URLs. And I think with the, that combination, that should cover it. Yeah. Any other questions? See some rest, like rustling around. I think we're probably ready for some pastries and drinks. Mm -hmm. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.